your Bible together. Uh, it'll be on your screen if you hold your Bibles high to the sky. Uh, we'll say, them, say this together. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, and I will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. Father, we love you. We give you glory. We thank you, God, for the service we've had this morning. And now we look forward to diving into your word. We pray that these next few moments might bring glory to your name. God, in your name we pray today. Amen and amen. You may have a seat today. And if you'll open up your Bibles and turn to the book of John, uh, chapter number 3. And Robin, you can cut this down just a shade, but you don't have to cut down too much. Uh, that'll be good right there. Uh, John chapter number 3 is where we'll find ourselves today. You know, it's been a few weeks since we've been back in the book of John. Uh, we, a couple of weeks ago, stopped uh, walking through it verse by verse, and we traveled over to uh, 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18, looked at Elijah, and then the following week was Easter, and on Easter we looked at the rapture of the church, and then last week, of course, was homecoming, and Brother Gary was with us, and now, uh, four weeks later, we resume preaching uh, in the book of John. And uh, John chapter 3, hard to believe we're still in chapter 3. We've been in chapter 3 for some time, uh, but we are still in chapter number 3 and spend this Sunday and probably next Sunday in chapter 3 before we move on to chapter 4. And uh, I want to read verse number 22 through verse number 30 to you this morning if you'll follow along with me. After this, Jesus and his disciples went to the Judean countryside, the Bible says, where Jesus spent time with them and baptized. Now, I would have loved to have been one of the disciples at this moment in Jesus' ministry. You're thinking this is uh, within the first year to year and a half of the ministry of Jesus. Can you imagine what this time might have been like for the disciples? Here they are. They've been called off the Sea of Galilee to come and be fishers of men. They've received the call from brothers and all these things. And now these 12 men have went down with Jesus to Passover in Jerusalem. And they've spent the Passover with him there. And he spent the night with Nicodemus there telling him about being born again. And now Jesus just takes his 12, Miss Helen, just these 12 men and says, Guys, let's just go down here to the countryside and let's just spend a few days together. Let me just teach you for a little bit. I would have loved to have been one of those 12 who would have got to spend those few days with Jesus. I wonder what it would have been like. I just think in my heart as I look at that verse, Russell, I think about those first few days after salvation. And how those first few days after salvation, you're so fired up. And you're, you're the, the old saying is, Lonnie, you could take on hell with a squirt gun, right? And I just believe in my heart those first few days after salvation. Do you remember how the birds sang a little sweeter? And you remember those first few days after salvation, how the sun shined a little brighter and the clouds just seemed a little whiter and life was just at its fullest? I imagine that's the time the disciples are having with Jesus out there in the wilderness as he teaches them about who he is and he teaches them the scriptures. I mean, think of this. Learning the word of God from the word became flesh. Wouldn't that be amazing? Verse 23, John was also baptizing, speaking of John the Baptist in Anon near Salem. Because there was plenty of water there, people were coming and they were being baptized. Since John had not yet been thrown into prison. Verse 25, then a dispute arose between John's disciples and a Jew, or the Jews, about purification. So they came to John and they told him, Rabbi, the one that you testified about. And who was with you across the Jordan is baptizing, and everyone is flocking to him. John responded, no one can receive a single thing unless it is given to him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said I am not the Messiah, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the groom, but the groom's friend, who stands by and listens for him, rejoices greatly at the groom's voice. So this joy of mine is complete. Verse 30, maybe even your favorite verse in the Bible. A lot of, guys, a lot of folks uh, might even uh, take this and, and, and use this as their life verse. He must increase. I must decrease. You know, as you look across uh, the years, every generation that comes around is 
given a label, given a name. If you are in the room today and you're between the ages of 50 and probably 70, uh, you would say that you're part of the baby boomer generation, right? Some of y'all are part of the baby boomer generation. If you are from my generation between the ages of 20 and 40, you're considered to be from Generation X, right? What would we label the generation of today? As I think about that generation of today, I can only think of one label that we can truly give them, Ashley, and that is the me first generation. It's all about me. Self-centeredness. I'm the most important. My preferences, my wants, that's what matters. And unfortunately, unfortunately, that attitude of me first, right, it has seeped over into the other generations until today we live in a society that is self-centered. We all have our own wants and our own desires, and we want those things now. We live in a me first generation. But we as Christians, how should we live our lives? What should our attitude be? I truly believe as born-again believers in Christ, we should live with an I am second attitude. I am number two because he is number one. This life, friends, is not about you. This life is not about me. As a born again believer in Christ. In fact the Bible says in Galatians 2.20. For I have been crucified with Christ. Therefore I no longer live. But it is Christ who lives in me. So how do we as born again believers in Jesus Christ. How do we live against the flow? How do we live almost as a rebel in this me first generation. And say no it's not about me. It's about him. How do we live with this I am second attitude? I want to give you today just a few statements that I believe you can take with you and you're going to apply them to your life. And I truly believe if you take these statements I'm going to give you today, I believe you can keep yourself from being consumed with me and leave you being always consumed with him. Amen. Isn't that what we're looking for? We should all be living with this I am second attitude. So that's the message today, I am second. Now, your first statement that you can apply to your life today is this. And I want you to repeat it with me, Robert, if you'll go ahead to the next screen. I want you to repeat this after me. I will not. I will not. Not everybody repeat that. Let's say that again. I will not. I will not. Allow my preferences. Allow my preferences. To hinder. Hinder the work of God. The work of God. Let's say that all in one time. I will not allow my preferences to hinder the work of God. Now there's an old story that goes around the church and preaching and told it for years. It's about a man who found himself one day shipwrecked on a deserted island. Now in case you don't know what a deserted island is, a deserted island means you're out there all by yourself. Nobody else is there. Have you ever seen the movie Castaway? Most of you have probably seen it. Tucker, boy, you happy about that movie. Ain't you? Boy, you that Cast away. You know what it was like for him. He's out there on that deserted island. Well, this man, the story goes, he lived out on that deserted island for some time all alone. Lived out there for years and years and years. And then finally one day a ship pulled up. And all these people got out. And they said, we're here to rescue you. So the man, he's standing there. He's been there for some time. And these ones who came to rescue him, Daddy, they begin to look around, and they're amazed at all the construction that this man has done on the island. Over here to his to the right is the house that he's built. He's been out there for some time. He's got all kinds of rooms, upstairs, downstairs, even a basement. Amazed at what he built. They look over here to the left, and they see a post office that he built. They, they can't believe he built a post office, but he built one just in case anybody ever decided to send him a letter. He'd go down there and check every day, but he never received one. They looked over behind the post office, and they find a park that he built where he would go, and he'd spend his afternoons uh, walking and enjoying the sunlight. And then right behind the park is a hill. And they looked up on that hill, Russell, and there are two buildings up on top of the hill. 
And so they look at the man and they say, sir, we're just kind of perplexed. We know what everything else is, but what are those two buildings up on top of the hill? And he says, well, the building on the right, that's my church. That's where I go to church each and every Sunday. And so they said, well, that's nice. That's very nice. Well, sir, what, what's the building on the left? And he says, well, that's where I used to go to church. Some of y'all now sit again. He's out there all by himself. That's where I used to go to church. Now, we laugh at that illustration this morning. But if we're going to tell the truth in the church today, we are so caught up in our own preference. We're so caught up in what I want that oftentimes in the church we get so confused that we even lose sight of what it is we do want. And as you look around the church today, this is what we see. We see people hopping from one church to the next constantly, going from one place to the next. Now I suppose, I suppose there are times when going from one church to the next can be justified. In the sense that maybe the pastor has done something immoral, refuses to step down, or maybe the denomination that's over the door has become accepting of some lifestyle. I suppose those things would be, or those reasons would be justified reasons for going from one church to another. But the majority of times, that's not the case. The majority of times that people leave the church to go to a, another church, they leave, why? Because their preference, their church style, their idea of what the church should be is not being met. Tell me if you've never heard these statements before. Well, that church service down there is just too long for me. You've all heard that, haven't you? I've been here four years. I hear it every week. <laughs> the air conditioner is set too cold. Sunday school starts too early. Someone sitting in my chair. They painted the walls white and they should have painted them blue. The music is too loud. The music is too quiet. The piano is out of tune. They stopped using the organ that my grandmother donated in 1785. The preacher preaches too long. The preacher is boring. boring. I just do not get a blessing when I go down to that church. Y'all both heard those things, haven't you? Yeah. Too often we allow our preferences to get in the way of what God may be trying to do in the life of a church. Amen. Let's think about it for a minute. Let's be honest. All of us in this room, I believe if we're honest, we would say that sometimes we get stuck in our ways. Hey, I'll be honest with you. I'll give you a great illustration. Y'all know me. What did I tell Brother Russell Smith this morning? I told you, I said, I enjoyed First Baptist Praise Band on Friday night, but I'm a hymn guy. And a southern gospel guy. That just wasn't for me. Right? That's just kind of how I am. We all get stuck in our own ways. Not willing to accept anything from the outside. We get stuck in our traditions. We get stuck in our cliques. We do not appreciate it when someone comes in and they begin to stir the pot a little. We don't like it when a new program is introduced and it takes us out of our comfort. If you don't believe what I'm saying, think about it this way. Do we not get ruffled? Do we not get agitated? Do we not get what you would maybe say bamboozled? When someone gets saved inside the church, they get a little fire about them. They get a little excitement about them. They begin to raise their hands during praise and worship time. They begin to shout when the preacher starts preaching. They start bringing in lost friends and lost loved ones. They have a little excitement in their bones. Let's be honest, a lot of times when we see someone like that, unfortunately, we get upset, don't we? That's right. We get upset because we're truly set in our ways and we're not used to seeing someone fired up by the Holy Spirit of God. And when they come in and they begin to stir the pot a little bit, it takes us out of our comfort zone. It gets us all frazzled. We don't like it. This is what was taking place at this point in the life of Jesus, in the narrative of Jesus that we find here in John 3. Look what the Bible says there in John 3, 22. After this, 
Jesus and his disciples went to the Judean countryside where he spent time with them and baptized. John the Baptist was also baptizing in a non near Salem because there was plenty of water there. People were coming and being baptized since John had not yet been thrown into prison. Then listen to verse 25. Then, what? A dispute broke out between John's disciples and the Jews about purification. Verse 26, so they come to John and they question him. Rabbi, the one you testified about, the one you said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, because of him, Rabbi, that one who is with you across the Jordan, he's baptizing and everybody's flocking to him. Now here's John the Baptist's disciples. They're following the last of the great prophets of the Old Testament. They're following that prophet that all of us know was wild-eyed, long hair, long beard. How do we know that was a Nazarite? He never cut his hair, never shaved his beard, long hair, long beard, wore camel hair garments, leather belt, ate locusts and wild honey. They're following him around. And the Bible says in Mark chapter 1 that as John was going, the whole Judean countryside, and all the people of Jerusalem were flocking to him, and they were being baptized in the Jordan River. That means that multitudes upon multitudes of people are following John the Baptist everywhere he goes. And even his own disciples are beginning to wonder in their heart, could John be the Messiah? Could he be the one that we have waited on all of these years? Is he indeed the one sent and chosen by God? And now there's a new teacher on the scene. His name is Jesus. And these disciples who have left everything to follow John the Baptist are upset. Because people aren't coming to John anymore like they did when he first started preaching. Now they're flocking to Jesus. Now they're flocking to this new rabbi, this new teacher. And they're upset about it. It stirs their pot. It upsets them. Truth be told, Miss Gay, they're just a little bit jealous about it. And so when they come to John the Baptist with this question about purification, they're not coming, Gary, with pure intentions. No, they're coming hoping that John the Baptist will get upset. And that he'll go down to Jesus and he'll condemn Jesus and put him to shame. And then there's this other group known as the Jews. This religious select elect group that's been sent up from Jerusalem. And isn't it interesting that dude, just two chapters ago these very Jews were against John the Baptist? These very Jews were the ones who came almost in condemning fashion seeking to know who he was and why he came. And now they've partnered up with John the Baptist's disciples. And they're wanting questions answered. Why? Because Jesus was teaching. And people were following. And it was teaching like they had never heard before. And it was upsetting them a little bit. And they were hoping as well that John would go to Jesus and label him as a blasphemer and destroy him like they had already said in their hearts to do. Just think about it for a moment. Here's John the Baptist's disciples and this religious elect group trying to hinder the work of God with the life and the mission of Jesus Christ. Trying to stop the fire that it began raging in the hearts of men because Jesus was accomplishing the mission that had been set forth before the foundations of the world. And here they are, these two groups, joining together, hoping to put it all to an end. Why did they do that, Shannon? It was because it was something different. Something they didn't like. Their preferences, their traditions... Their teachings were being upset. And they aimed it in their heart. They said aim in their heart to put an end to this movement before it ever really got started. I know what this is like. When I first was saved and became a preacher, I was a wild man. When I say wild man, Jerry, you know what I mean. I used to wear 
crazy colored jackets with crazy colored ties and plaid pants and red and yellow shoes. And I had these big old thick black glasses that I used to wear around. And I'd go and I'd preach and I'd preach like a wild man, running back and forth on stage. And I started going to a church in Rock Hill, the church that I grew up in. And I'll never forget when I went into the church, I'd just been saved. I hadn't been to church really there in 10 years. But here I am. I'm wanting to serve. I'm wanting to give back. I'm wanting to preach. I'm wanting to teach. And the people who had been there for all of these years, it began to upset them. They didn't like me. They didn't want me to be there. They didn't like the fact that I was preaching and teaching God's Word. And I can still remember as I would walk down the hallway, I can remember their, their stares, and I can remember their scoffs as I would come in the door, walking down the hallway, as you could hear them whisper. I'll never forget when the interim pastor at the time I was there, when he resigned. I thought that maybe God would allow me, or maybe they would allow me the opportunity to preach there a few times. I was a young preacher, and I just wanted a chance. And I'll never forget the chairman of the search committee sitting me down and telling me these words. Zach, you're not going to get an opportunity. Do not even get it in your head. We're not going to let you preach. And oh, it hurt me. And I'll never forget another night as I went to youth group and Summer was there and I was teaching the youth and I was in youth group and these three men came in the room and I honestly thought, Jerry, they were coming to listen to me teach. I had never seen them in there before. And they came in and listened to what I said and then when I got home, those three men had went over to social media outlets like Facebook and they had twisted my words and they had blasted me all over the internet saying things like, Zach Williams does not believe in mirrors. When I would preach, when I would get the opportunity to preach, my parents and grandparents, they can testify to this. Every time I get the opportunity to preach there, even up to last summer when I preached there, every time I go to preach, the microphones begin to pop. The videos that we bring in, they won't play. Some of them back then demanded what? That I would not be allowed to teach. That I would have, a, have to have a background check. That I'd have to have a drug screen just to be a Sunday school teacher. But why? Simply because I had a fire for Jesus in my heart. Amen. And it rocked the boat because I preach and I teach the truth of God's word. And it upset them. And they desired to destroy me before it ever got started. That's what's going on here in the life of Jesus. Friends, I pray. At Second Baptist Church, I pray that we would never try to stop the fire that begins to rage in the heart of a man when he's saved. Amen. I plead with you that you would never allow your own traditions, your own preferences to hinder the work of God that he may be doing in someone's life or in the life of the church. Instead, this morning, let's all commit to say no to tradition, no to custom, that we will make a commitment today to embrace the work of God that he's doing in our midst, that we will worship him because of the things that he's trying to accomplish. Truly, if we're going to live with this attitude of I am second, we have to say this, I will not allow my preferences to hinder the work of God. There's a second statement that you can apply to your life today if you want to live with this attitude of I am second. And I want you to repeat this one with me. I will remember, I will remember the, source the source of my blessing. The source of my blessing. Y'all are getting quiet. I need y'all to say it a little bit louder. Let's say it for time. I will remember the source of my blessings. We sing the song, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. But do we really praise him for our blessings? Do we really acknowledge him for what he has given us? If we're going to live with the attitude of I am second, we will remember the source of our blessing. Now I hold in my hand, let me get this out. I hold in my hand a trophy that I won two years ago. Uh, let's see what it says. I forget. 2012. Small church, pastor of the year for the state of South Carolina. 
Now let me ask you a question. What if I took this trophy and I carried it everywhere I went? I walked into the grocery store, I had it under my arm. Whenever somebody like John David Wilson or another church, they invited me to preach. What if when I stepped up in the pulpit, I carried my Bible in my left hand and my trophy in my right hand? And what if I said it right there when I preach revivals and say, boy, y'all sure are blessed. <laughs> y'all get to listen tonight to the 2012 small church pastor of the year. What if when I came to your house to sit down with you and talk to you, what if I brought this thing in and set it down on the coffee table and said, you know what? If you come to Second Baptist Church, you're going to be blessed because this 2012 small church pastor of the year is the pastor down there. Oh, and by the way, that's me. <laughs> what if when you came for marriage counseling, I said, boy, you're blessed because you're going to be, marriage, be counseling in your marriage by the 2012 small church pastor of the year. What would you think of me if every time you saw me, I carried this thing in my hand? What if every time you saw me, I was all too willing to flash it in front of you? Could you imagine my deacons who are here? Could you imagine if every time we went to a deacons meeting, I just sat that front and center so y'all boys could see it? Could you imagine? What would you think of me? You would think of me, you would think these things. You would think, boy, he sure is cocky. Wouldn't you? Yeah. I'm not second. <laughs> Oh, Chris, sure is not the <laughs> You say, boy, he sure is bragging. He sure is boastful. He sure is filled with pride and filled with self. And then you'd probably say something like this. That old boy needs to eat a piece of humble pie. <coughs> that's a, of course that's what you would think, would you not? But here's the thing. You don't see me walking around with this trophy everywhere I go, do you? And probably for the most of you in this room, that's the first time you've ever even heard of this award. Other than those who were probably here the day that Tommy Bailey announced it, you probably didn't even know that I had it. You probably never hear me talk about it. Why? Because in my heart, I know that I did nothing to deserve it. I did nothing to prove myself worthy of receiving it. And in the grand scheme of things, you know what's going to happen to this old trophy? One day I'll die. Somebody will give it to Tucker and Noel Williams. And you know what they'll do? They'll probably put it in a box, throw it up in some attic somewhere, where it will collect dust until God destroys this world by fire. This trophy means nothing. I know in my heart this morning I could have never received it. The only reason this award is in my possession is because God gave me the ability, the knowledge, and the wisdom to pastor the church that he called me to. Without him, I wouldn't even have the ability to preach, much less win an award like this. I know in my life today that all of my blessings, that anything God has given me, he deserves the glory and the praise for anything that's happened in my life. Everything I am, everything I have, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, is considered a loss. Is that not what the Apostle Paul said? Paul said, everything I have, everything I counted as something, I count as nothing in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ. Do you remember this morning that God is the one who gives you all that you have? I call you this morning, Second Baptist Church, if you're going to live with this I am second attitude, to remember your source of blessing. Now think of John the Baptist here. It would have been easy for him in that moment to have looked around at all the influential people that surrounded him. The people who themselves had their own followers, their own circle of influences, because they were seen as the greatest religious leaders of their day. It would have been easy for John the Baptist to look at them and say, you know what, boys, you're right. Jesus, he is a blasphemer. He is out to destroy the law and the law of Moses and the truth from the Old Testament. And you know what, boys, if you would just follow me and push my teaching, that we could become the most powerful religious group that has ever walked the face of the planet. It would have been easy for John the Baptist to have seen all of those 
people around him. It would have been easy for him to swell up in pride and say, this is all about me. Look at what I have accomplished. Look at what I have done. Look at who I am. But instead, with these two groups of influential leaders standing in front of him and staring him in the face, and with the opportunity to become esteemed before men, John the Baptist said in verse 27, No one can receive a single thing unless it's given to him from heaven. Friends, we do well this morning to remember from whom our blessing flow. In the church today, I see many people who forget this one simple truth that we're speaking of here. Let me ask you a few questions. Who is the source of all blessing? Who is the giver of good and perfect gifts? Who alone is the giver of grace? Who alone is the giver of mercy? Who alone is the giver of compassion? Who alone is the giver of love? God and God alone. If that's true and you honestly know it's true, then why do you walk around with your nose up in the air like you are somebody? <coughs> Don't you see? Don't you know? Don't you understand that you have nothing in this life that hasn't been given to you? Except it be given to you by the Father in heaven. Material things, he's the owner of a cattle on a thousand hills and he gives them. Physical looks, some of y'all think you got them. And even if you think you got them, you look so good, remember that God gave them to you. Wisdom, he grants it through his word. No matter what you have today, God is the bestower of all blessings and all gifts, and it is only by him that you have anything. Indeed, even the next breath you inhale and exhale is given as a blessing from him. How many of us this morning fall into the trap of looking at all we have and saying, look at the work of my hands. Look at what I have accomplished in my life. We like to lift ourselves up so that others will see us and believe that we are something special. When in all reality, in the sight of God, we are nothing more than filthy rags. But because God is a good God, and because God allows the rain to shine or the rain to fall on both the righteous and the unrighteous, we have gifts and blessings that we do not deserve. Amen. We in the church need to be especially aware of where our blessings come from. In the church today, we have a lot of people who are all too quick to say, because of who I am, because of my money, because of my knowledge, because of my talents, this church is mine. And this church cannot survive without me. Friends, I want to tell you, if that's you who thinks this church can't go on without you because of how great you are, you better be careful. Because it could be that today the Lord Jesus Christ just forced you on out the door so that you can see that you might not be as special as you think you are. It's happened recently at a church that I know of. Same thing happened. Someone thought they were somebody. They left and came back a few weeks later and observed the services. And when they left that day, this is what they said. I came back today to see if y'all could make it without me. And I guess y'all are doing just fine, so I won't do that. <coughs> what does James say in his epistle? Every generous act and every perfect gift is from who? From above. Coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow cast by turning. When was the last time you thank God for all that He's given you? When was the last time you looked around and all you had and just simply said, God, thank you for blessing me? 
Friend, I promise you this. If you live each and every day with the attitude of, I will remember my source of blessing, it will be impossible for you to ever become so prideful in your life that you begin to think you're somebody because of all you've done and all the things you have, that you are something. You keep your eyes on Jesus. You keep your heart focused on God. You give him praise. You give him thanks. And you will never be the person who says, look at the work of my hands. Instead, when someone comes along and says, oh, you're so blessed, you'll say, it's not because of me. Amen. It's all because of him. Amen. And I give him the glory. If we're going to live with the attitude and the motto of I'm second, first of all, we must not allow our traditions to hinder the work of God. Secondly, or our preferences to enter the word of God. Secondly, we must remember the source of our blessings. But then thirdly, say this with me. I will keep a proper perspective. Say that one more time. I will keep a proper perspective. I will keep a proper perspective. Now let me tell you what happened last Sunday afternoon. The choir was here at 5 in the afternoon to practice for revival. The choir was going to sing. And I got here, and, and I went back in the sound room where Robin was because I was going to type up the, the lyrics for the, the hymn we were singing that night to be up on the PowerPoint. And I told old Bobby there that I would run the sound for him while he was up here doing, uh, uh, leading the choir. And so Bobby, he's up here leading the choir, and he turns around and he says these words to me. Hey, Jack, hey, Jack, go ahead and push the button. And then the whole choir said, hey, Bobby, his name's not Jack. His name, Zach. And old Bobby turned around and said, I'm so sorry, preacher, I'm so sorry. And I said, what, Bobby? I've been called much worse. <laughs> now, if you're from York Rock Hill area and you've been around me long enough, I promise you, you will hear somebody call me Josh. Why? Because I have a cousin named Josh. And me and Josh resemble each other. And I remember when I worked at Founders Credit Union, my cousin Josh was a teacher at Wallace Road Middle School for years and years. And people would come in to found the credit union, and they would say, hey, Josh, how you doing? And I would say, well, I'm doing just fine. And they'd say, well, how's your mom and daddy, Cindy and Johnny? And I'd say, well, they're doing just fine. And they'd say, well, how's the, the stuff going at Ross Road Middle School? And I'd say, well, I'm working at Founders. It must not be going too good. <laughs> they called Josh all my life. All my life, I've been known as Willie's little brother. <laughs> I've been called good things, I've been called bad things, I've been called nicknames, I've been called short names, I've even been called names that aren't mine. Do you know why nobody in this room or anybody's ever called me? No one's ever called me the Messiah. Why don't you call me the Messiah? Because you know I'm far from it. You know what else you'll never hear me call myself? You'll never hear me stand in this pulpit and say, y'all have to now call me the Messiah, the Christ. If I ever do, y'all please run me out the door. Make that promise in your heart today. Now you may wonder where I'm going with this, but think about it. how many preachers, how many influential Christians do you know that start off with pure intention? They start off preaching and teaching the truth of God's word with a heart to lead others to Jesus, but then fortune comes, then fame comes, and they begin to build their own empires their own kingdoms, and soon it's them that are being worshipped instead of the Lord That's Jesus. Right. Amen. Let me just remind everybody in this room that Ephesians chapter 1 verse 22 says, and he put everything under his feet and appointed him, speaking of Jesus, as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. If we're going to be the man or the woman who lives with the I am second attitude, we have to remember our place. Our place, Russell, is not the head. No, our place is the body of Christ. There is one head, there is one Messiah, there is one Lord. His name is Jesus. And guess what? You are not him. John the Baptist had followers, people, that guess what? They wanted him to be their Messiah. They thought he was the one they had waited for. And they wanted him to be the one that would go to Jerusalem and take up the throne of David. Why? 
Because he was bold. He was fierce. He was not afraid of the authority. He told it like it was. This was a man they could worship. This was a man they could see being the Christ, the Messiah. And here's John the Baptist. He could have let it all go to his head, but he didn't. Instead, what did he say in verse 28? You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah. But I have been sent ahead of him. John the Baptist had a proper perspective. <laughs> he knew he wasn't the Messiah. Instead, he was the one who was sent to herald the good news that the king was coming. John said, it's not me. What have I told you before about John the Baptist? That he lived his life with one finger pointed at all times toward the one greater than him, <laughs> Jesus. Every time you see John the Baptist, what's he doing? He's pointing to Jesus. Are you the Messiah? No. But he's coming. I can't untie his sandal straps. John, who is that Jesus? He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Are you the Messiah? No, I'm not the Messiah. I've told you I'm not the Messiah. But I've been sent ahead of him. Friends, we would do well this morning to live our lives always with one finger pointed to Jesus. Amen. Our lives always being pointed toward Him. Our faces ever fixed upon Him. Our eyes ever gazing at Him. Knowing that He is the author and the finisher of our faith. Knowing that he alone has the ability and the power to save. The one who deserves our worship and our praise and our adoration. But unfortunately in the church today, we have people who do not live with this type of attitude. We have people who do not live with one finger pointed to Jesus. Said this same apostle who wrote this gospel, the book of John, also wrote a few epistles and the book of Revelation. He wrote an epistle that you all know is 3 John. And in 3 John, he speaks of a man named Diotrephes. And this is how he describes Diotrephes. He says, Diotrephes, he loves to have first place among the church. He does not receive us. This is why, if I come, I will remind him of the works he's doing, how he slanders us with malicious words. And he's not satisfied with that. He not only refuses to welcome the brothers himself, but he even stops those who wants to do so and expels them from the church. How the church today is filled with men and women like Diotrephes, who like to have first place and wants to stop the work of the church, the work of God, because it might take away their position in the church. Friends, I will tell you this, that being labeled as a diatrophies is not a good distinction to have. It's not good to be known in the church as that guy who wants to have first place. As that one who thinks the church revolves around them. As the one who thinks without me this church is going to go under. Throughout the week, I talk to pastors who are having all kinds of difficulties. And I praise God, I, I promise you. Sometimes... Somebody in here might get under my skin, and I might think it's tough. And then God calls, get somebody to call me, and I realize I don't have it so bad after all. I had a friend of mine who called me the other day. This is what he said to me. He said, Zach, I'm really having a tough time right now. He said, we recently had deacon elections at our church. And he said, there's a man in the church who holds a lot of power, a lot of influence in the church. He's from the most esteemed family in the church. And he's always elected deacon, and he rolled off a year ago, and he's set to come back home this year, but he wasn't elected deacon this year. He said, for whatever reason, the, the church, he said, I prayed the church elected four brand new men to serve as deacon. He wasn't one of them. He said, this man is really upset about this thing and has demanded a recount. He said, so we recounted the votes, and once again, after recounting the votes, it was declared that he was not a deacon. He said, so last Sunday night after the service was over, this man came up on the stage when I was about to come off the stage. He came up on the stage and he grabbed the pulpit and he shoved it over at me. 
And he said he started to holler at me in front of all my church members and tell them that, that I could not be trusted, that I was a liar, that I was a phony, that I was a fraud. I know y'all done that to me yet. Please tell me. <laughs> <laughs> that I was a liar, that I was a fraud. He said, I just stood my ground and I told him, you didn't win the election. Just leave it alone. And then he said, but that's not it. He said, just the other day he called me on the phone and told me he was leaving the church but that he was not going to withdraw his membership and that he was going to continue sending his tithe down to the church, but he was going to designate them for the Annie Armstrong Easter offering so that none of the work of the church would be supported by this money. Why does this man act like this? He acts like this because he wants to be in charge. He loves to have first place among them. He wants to be the head. Let me just remind you, you are not Jesus. Keep a proper perspective and remember your place. And if you do, you will live with the I am second attitude, which was the attitude of John the Baptist. It's all about him. See three statements today that I believe you can apply to your life to live with the honest second attitude. I'm not allowing my own preferences to hinder the work of God. I will remember my source of blessing. I will keep a proper perspective. But I want to give you number four. And we'll close with this one. Say this with me. I will give praise to be consumed. Say that one more time. I will give praise to be consumed. I will give praise. To whom it's due. This is what I've always loved about John the Baptist. He knew his place. He knew who he was. He knew who Jesus was. And there was no one that was going to convince him otherwise. He lived his life to give praise to the one that it was due. And I pray that our lives will be lived with the same attitude as John the Baptist. That we would live our lives to uplift the name of Jesus in everything we do. That Jesus' name would be far above our name. That Jesus' name and his power and his name would be the central focus of all our efforts here in the church and outside of these walls. I pray today that when people would see us, that they would know one thing for certain, that we live our lives in the light of Jesus Christ our Lord, and that we lift him up in all aspects of our lives. I ask you the question, how did John the Baptist live this way? He lived this way because he knew who Jesus was. He knew that he was God in the flesh. He admired him, he was captivated by him, he was drawn to him, and there was just something about Jesus that he could not deny. He knew that Jesus was Lord, and John the Baptist loved him. And because of that, John the Baptist was able to say these words in John chapter 3. Listen to these words. You don't want to miss this. Verse 29. He who has the bride is the groom. But the groom's friend who stands by and listens for him rejoices greatly at the groom's voice. But this joy of mine is complete. He must increase. I must decrease. As the friend of the groom, his job was to ask for the hand of the bride, <laughs> to arrange the preliminaries of the wedding, and to oversee the reception of the bride and the groom. John the Baptist had done this. And now at this point in his life, his cup of joy overflowed because now everyone can hear the voice of the groom instead of his own. In other words, John refers to something all of us in the room are familiar with. At a wedding, the bride is interested in only one person. She's interested in only her groom. And the groom, his joy is found in his bride. 
But back then and as we have today, there's a best man, the friend of the groom. The best man, right? He found joy in the groom's delight. And so John says here, I'm just like that. I am the groom's friend. The Lord Jesus Christ, he is the groom. The bride belongs to him, not to me. I will rejoice in his gladness. And I do not feel slighted one bit. And I do not feel set aside because I cannot claim the love and the allegiance of the bride. John says, no, I rejoice because the groom is now here. He has been revealed to Israel. My part is done. My joy is complete. And because of that, I must decrease so that he may increase. His time is now. I was the one who was to come before him. But now that he's on the scene, my time has departed. John took a subordinate place and he rejoiced because of the groom's joy. The Apostle Paul, he expressed the same thing in, first, uh, in the first chapter of Philippians. He said there that his great joy was that Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. And then he went on to say, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. I wonder, I wonder, if we as children of God today can enter into this attitude and this lifestyle of I'm saved. Listen to these next few questions I'm going to ask you. Are we content today, are you content today to serve without personal recognition? Or are you ambitious to be counted as somebody or something in a world that has rejected our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Are you seeking places of power and authority or recognition even in the church of God itself? If you are, it's to deny the spirit that was seen in John the Baptist and in the Apostle Paul. Their one earnest desire was to make much of Christ. And they themselves were willing to be lost sight of. I want to ask you this. Would you be willing today to say, it's my work to serve the Lord Jesus Christ and in my day and generation and once my time is over to be lost sight of? Are we willing to say today, I'm willing that others shall get the glory if there is any for the work that is to be done? Oh, what a wonderful spirit that is. How we need to pray that we may learn more of the meekness and the gentleness of John the Baptist. That spirit that says, never mind the me. If Christ is glorified, that is all I'm concerned about. I do not want them to think of me. I do not want them to make anything of me. There was a man named Wim Carey who was on his deathbed. And as Mr. Carey lied dying, he turned to his friend and he said these words. When I'm gone, don't talk about William Carey. Talk about <coughs> William Carey's Savior. I desire that Christ alone be magnified. Amen. And so with John here and so with us, it should be our joyous motto. Less about me, more about him. Let me decrease that he may increase. For I am sad. I wonder today if there's somebody in the room who may be born again, but would say, you know what? Preacher Zach, I know in my own heart that I've been living and working and serving the church simply and solely so that I can get glory and honor and praise. And because of the word spoken today, I know that I need to repent. And I know that I need to live my life with an I'm second attitude, knowing that he alone deserves the glory. If that's you this morning, friend, I'll ask you to just come to the altar and lay it down. And make a commitment today to say, I'm not going to live that way any longer. I'm not going to allow my preferences to hear the work of God. I'm going to remember my source of blessing. I'm going to remember my perspective. And not only that, but I'm going to give praise to whom it's due. 
But then secondly, this morning, if you come in the door and you don't know the I'm second life because you've never been saved, then I'm going to ask you today to make the greatest, the greatest decision you could ever make. And that is to finally make Jesus the Lord of your life. You can never live second until he becomes first in the first place. So I ask you today, if you've never been born again, to give your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Brother Robin, you can go ahead and hit play on the invitation. If you'll stand at this time, I'm going to pray, and the altar will be open. Father, we love you. We give you glory. We give you praise. We give you honor. We pray, God, that today your name might be glorified and magnified in this place. And that, God, your name might be glorified and magnified in our lives. And that we may truly live with the motto, I am second. Let me decrease so that you may increase. I pray over this congregation that, Lord, if anybody today is living in such a way where they're wanting themselves to be glorified, their own names to be esteemed, that the day they lay on this altar and say, God, it's not about me, it's about you. May this be the motto that we live each and every day. I am second. And God, I pray if there be somebody in this room that doesn't know it, that today would be the day of salvation. It's in the name of Jesus we do pray. Amen. You come this morning as the Lord leads you to come.